Kicking off the list at number 10, astronomy. You ever want to date somebody, but they're a Libra and you're a Gemini? Oh, ain't that the worst? Look, dating apps even have this now as a feature. You can write down what your symbol is, like, hi, I'm Kyle, I'm a Leo, and I love waking up early. Those are real bios for real people, and we have the Mayans to thank for all of this. The Maya studied the stars. They were the pioneers of our calendar, which I'll explain a little bit later on, but they also created lunar months. They figured that 81 lunar months added up to 2,392 days, meaning that one lunar month is 29.53 days, incredibly close to our modern moon month, which is crazy. They nailed it that long ago. They also studied Jupiter, Mars, and Mercury. They studied where each planet travels to and when. If you're a Libra, like me, smash that thumbs up. I'm a late Libra too. We're just trouble. We're the worst of the worst. Number nine, the Mayan calendar. It's 2022, which means the world thankfully did not end in 2012, but the Mayan calendar predicted that on December 21st, 2012, apparently it would be this massive doomsday. No, if no meteors hit, that was all false. That wasn't a real thing. Thanos didn't snap any of us away. Nothing like that happened. But that day did mark the end of their 5,125 year long count calendar. Yeah, and you thought you were a planner, okay. The Mayan calendar is extremely accurate. Their calendar is 10 thousands of a day more exact than the calendar that the world uses today. They're that precise. We have leap years and stuff just to try and correct it. They used 20 day months and had two calendar years. They had a 260 day sacred round and then a 365 day year. Every 52 years, these two calendars would coincide with one another and this was referred to as a bundle. Imagine if we still had this now, that'd be so confusing. But 10, Nine, eight, what are we saying? Seven. Number eight, chocolate. When I visited the UK, the, the first thing I noticed was how much better your chocolate was. So good. I'm not sure what y'all are doing over there. Maybe it's just made with love. Who knows, but I'm a huge chocolate guy and the UK nails it. Yeah, wash it down with some iron brew. Buddy, what a day, what a great day. The Mayans as well, turns out they loved chocolate. The old mechs of Mesoamerica figured out how to consume chocolate, but the Mayans made it beautiful. They added some spice to it, literally. The Mayans would mix chocolate with water, chili peppers, and honey. They would make a spicy drink. Are you into this idea? Is this making your lips happy right now? Spicy chocolate drinks? My tummy can barely handle a pumpkin spice latte, let alone a Mayan milkshake. No, thank you. Number seven. Math. One of the earliest uses of the number zero, being in mathematics, came from the Mayans. Thanks. Awesome. They were super advanced in their mathematics, I would say, for their time, but no, in general, they were advanced. We're still trying to understand how they achieved what they did without calculators. It's impressive. They drew complex hieroglyphs on long strips of paper made from fig tree bark. They didn't have much to work with here, yet somehow it was still enough. The Maya numerical system only had three symbols. This was long before Bedmaz was born. They had zero, one, and five. That's it, you could literally count on one hand. There's a shell shape, a dab, and a bar. These numbers went from zero to 19, and then they would count groups of 20. By the time 36 BC rolled around, the Maya were introducing the concept of zero into their numbering system. Thanks guys, I failed math twice because of those zeros. Cheers. Number six, glyphs. Glyphs at number six, six glyphs. One of the most advanced forms of writing when it comes to all these ancient Americans, the Maya were the most ahead of their time. They invented the glyph, which are these symbols that represent a word or a sound. Like anything else in this civilization, it's beautiful to look at, of course. The Maya used around 700 different glyphs. They're detailed, they're beautiful. A good amount we're able to translate today, but there's still a mysterious chunk that we're trying to figure out. The earliest glyphs engravings go back to the third century BC, meaning that the Maya are the pioneers of writing in Mesoamerica. There are only a few civilizations where writing naturally occurred. The Mayans, ancient Chinese, and the ancient Mesopotamians. Number five, rubber. Rubber is a fundamental. I mean, sure, the long-term effects for rubber are questionable in turn. Now we have literal pits full of tires, but where did it all begin and why? The Maya created art, they looked to the stars and made calendars, but what did they do when they wanted to have a good time? Mayan meals were composed of maize, squash, and beans with tons of crops. Turns out the Maya were the ones who created elastic long before Mr. Goodyear over here. They made elastic from latex by mixing it with other plants. They really created bouncy balls, if anything. They took latex from trees and mixed it with vine juice. This was around 1600 BC, and you can't invent rubber balls without creating some. Number four. Ball games. Yeah, imagine inventing a bouncy ball. You can now create any game you want, any rules. You'll never lose again. How great is that? The Maya have pretty impressive ball courts. These games were all but fun, honestly. These were religious events. These games would last around 20 days on average, so I hope you 
warmed up that harm because you're going to be here for a while. The pressure was always on also from the overlords as these courts were built at the bottom of a sanctuary. Yeah, hey, no pressure, but uh, your ex is here with Zeus. Break a leg. The go-to game was called pocket talk or hodgepodge and you had to throw a heavy elastic ball through a hoop. Instead of fist bumping at the end of the day saying good game, good game, good game, the losing side would either one, not survive, dark, or they would have to give over all of their belongings, which also sucks. Yeah, a 20 day game and then you'd lose all your stuff. That's horrible, what a horrible month. Number three, art. Of course we have to mention art. I'm not saying the Mayans invented art by any means. Each of these ancient civilizations had their own way of expressing the afterlife or life in general. Art was just everywhere. The Mayans specialized in decorating stone landmarks. There's only a handful of woodcut art pieces, but the most popular are these stone pieces from Copan and Carigua. They're extremely complex as well, obviously. Look at these. Rock climbers couldn't even get their fingers in these greaves. You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. Yet somehow people made them. These zoomorphs here are giant rock sculptures created in the shape of animals, which are always fun. And of course, the Mayans are also famous for their wall paintings dating back to 200 BC. One of the most well preserved is at Bonampak. Look at this. This is incredible. We often look at Egyptians and their art, but this is incredible too. Often overlooked. Number two. Laws. The Maya made their own ball games. They made their own rules. They made chocolate their own way. But they also created law and order. In a time where food and shelter was sparse, you would think it would be a lot like the Dark Ages. Just a bloody mess, you know, full of thieves and bodies and bad stuff everywhere. Well, when you're the first civilization to create the death penalty, everybody is pretty well behaved afterwards. More than fair. Yeah, fair. Taking the life of others was uncommon because of these harsh laws. I mean, you remember how those ball games would end, right? Yeah, imagine crimes. If you were to take the life of another, say you lost a ball game, all your goods are now gone, you react in a horrible way, well, who comes knocking at your door asking questions? Who says you're now a suspect? Sherlock Holmes? No. Say you live with somebody and they commit a crime. Well, not only are they now gone after they get caught, but the victim also gets your land. They get all your goods, cattle, your home, everything. So whoever lives with you as well, well, you better pack your rubber balls. You're out of here. You don't live here anymore, thanks to Good Game Gordo over here. I'm glad certain things stuck around, like the law and order part, but uh, imagine being evicted because your roommate stole some beans. God damn it, Craig. Don't do that. And finally, number one, the underworld. Also referred to as the place of fright. Okay, save the best for last, we love it. Zibalba comes from Mayan mythology. Overseen, of course, by the Mayan death gods, Zibalba came to be in the 16th century Verapaz. The entrance to such a wonderful place was in the cave of Guatemala. So, splunkers beware if you're putting that on your agenda. Maybe avoid this one. Caves in Belize are actually known as the entrance to Zibalba, these water-filled caves again, and they span as far as 300 feet. That's a massive evil front door you wanna avoid right there. But you can't just grab a snorkel and frog kick your way to the underworld, it's not that easy. According to ancient Maya scripture, the Popol Vuh, this path once filled with dark obstacles, and when I say dark obstacles, I mean dark. I'm talking a river filled with scorpions and blood combined with houses littered with bats and pure darkness. It's not easy to get through. It's like those haunted houses in Niagara Falls. It's really scary. This is why you don't cheat in Mayan ball games. You end up here. Do you wanna be here? No. In fact, if you cheat in Monopoly, I believe you also end up here. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Stacy. Don't cheat. Number 10, tea. I honestly don't think I could make it through the day without a cup of tea in the morning. The Brit in me just can't do it. But I owe this to China. Specifically, I owe this to Chinese Emperor Shenong from way back in 2737 BC. Now listen to this story. Once upon a time, Emperor Shenong liked to drink hot water. One day, while out on a march with his army, they stopped to rest and catch their breath. At the camp, a servant was preparing Shenong's hot water when a leaf from a tree fell and landed in the water, turning it brown. Instead of discarding the new liquid, it was presented to the emperor, who drank and found it refreshing. Boom! Tea. While used as medicine before this, in the Tang Dynasty, it really became a common beverage enjoyed by many. This time period from 616 to 908 AD also saw the Book of Tea, written by Lu Yu, which contained ways to cultivate tea, tea drinking, and different classifications of tea in details. Thanks, Lu Yu. You the best. Number 9, Compass. A vast sea all drunken sailors and maybe Jack Sparrow, depending on how long the trial lasts. We'll see how it goes. The invention of the compass hails from the ancient land to the east. I learned again today. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not me. 
Way back in the Han Dynasty, the first use of the compass was accomplished with a lodestone. For those who forgot what that was from their grade 4 museum field trip, tisk tisk, it will be on the test later, as well as some vocabulary in English. A lodestone is a naturally occurring magnet and aligns itself with the magnetic field, brother. While only used for land at first, it wasn't long before it made its way onto a boat, where it speculated it was traded off into the Islamic world and eventually the west. My only experience with the compass was in Minecraft, and it doesn't point north, it points to spawn. Boy, did I learn the hard way. Number 8. Movable Type Printing Fun Fact! The first book with a verifiable date of printing appeared in China in the year 868, or nearly 600 years before that happened in Europe. While the printing press would come much later in Europe, the idea of being able to print identical copies without handwriting began 2,000 years ago in the Western Han Dynasty. You see, before this point, if you wanted to pass on the good word of your religion, or teach somebody something, or tell somebody about the past, or give secret little I love you notes to each other, you had to either do it by word of mouth or handwriting. <coughs> Gross. Then, in the previously mentioned Han Dynasty, people began stone tablet rubbing, which evolved into carving words and pictures onto a stone board, lathering that bad boy up with ink and pressing it onto paper. And boom, that's printing. But then, in 1041 to 1048, a guy named Bai Sheng carved characters on identical pieces of clay which he hardened by baking, resulting in pieces of movable type that could be stored and used again later. And now we have printers! Innovation, am I right? Number 7. Gunpowder Okay, sure, we all know what gunpowder is and what it does. After all, what's a soldier without his blam blam? A cowboy without his big iron? Or a pirate ship without cannons? I'd argue those things are nothing without that. However, I'd like to think of a more peaceful use, and not just because YouTube sweats when I bring up pistols. I remember a long time ago where my father would get a bucket from the Shmoam Depot. He'd fill it up with sand, and we'd walk to a secluded part of the suburban area and launch fireworks. Sometimes we'd launch them into the streets, but that depended on how much rye he had. Depends. At least there was a bucket. Safety first, right? Well, none of that would have been possible without the invention from China. Gunpowder was invented by Chinese alchemists in the 9th century. Originally, it was made by mixing elemental sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, potassium nitrate. The charcoal traditionally came from the willow tree, but grapevine, hazel, elder laurel, and pine cones have all been used in the process. Number 6. Deep Drilling the province of Sichuan in ancient China, yes, like the sauce, was landlocked and about 1,200 miles from the sea. Because of that, they ain't got no sea salt. So, in order to get salt, the ancient Chinese from around the 2nd century BC developed drilling technology to get brine from deep in the earth, which naturally forms from evaporation of ground saline water. Look at that. We're all learning today. Salt is obviously quite an important resource, but the boring and drilling technology only got better and better, resulting in more and more resources to be found, like natural gas, <laughs> which could be used as fuel. And in the 11th century, the Chinese had the technology to be able to drill those suckers up to 3,000 feet deep, which is pretty deep in case you did not know. Number 5. Silk I, for one, was always too broke to afford silk, especially after fireworks. Those bad boys are super expensive. Silk was an important thing in ancient China for the main reason that they invented the process of harvesting silk and were keeping it an ancient Chinese secret. Now, when you have a stockpile of a very valuable raw material that nobody else can get their hands on, and you have a stockpile of the finished product of which is a quality of clothing no one else can match, well, you're going to be quite wealthy. Well, I don't need to pitch this in the shark tank. It's time to start selling and trading, and that's just what China did. This was a very profitable trade, so it got its own road. Or roads, the Silk Road wasn't just, just one. The people who were buying from China loved it so much that they wanted their own instead of paying exuberant prices. But it took them a long time to figure out what the process actually was. They thought it grew on trees. It comes from Number four, acupuncture. Have you ever had acupuncture done? Have you ever had acupuncture done? I've not. Neither have I. Let us know in the comments. I want to know if it actually works. When I was looking up this topic, it was called pseudoscience and said that there was no actual scientific proof that it works. Whether it does or doesn't, the practice of acupuncture is ancient. We know this from a less ancient book called the Neijing that was written around 305 BC to 204 BC and was the earliest book of Chinese medicine we know of. It was also called the classic of internal medicine of the Yellow Emperor. Who was the Yellow Emperor? Well, 
That would be Huang Di, whose period lasted from 2697 to 2597 BC. And this guy, this emperor, revolutionized the practice of acupuncture. So all of that was a very long, long winded way of saying that acupuncture as a practice has been around for more than 4,722 years. Look, writing videos is hard, okay? Just give me a break. Number three, earthquake detector. Earthquakes are a big problem. It's an issue in California as they're still waiting for the big one. It's a problem in Pokemon. When the gym leader I thought was going to be easy surprises me with an earthquake and like one shots my team. And it was a problem in ancient China. I've already experienced one before myself in real life. And if I had to describe to anyone what it felt like, it felt like the ground was a waterbed. Some of you are probably not going to know what a waterbed is, but that's what it felt like. Well, it was so much of an issue that Zhang Hang made the groundbreaking invention of a seismometer, a device that can detect ground movement. It can't predict them, but it can tell you where they're coming from, using vibrations and tiny balls that would fall into frog-shaped cups depending on which direction it was coming from, something that goes hand in hand with the compass from earlier. Oh, interesting. Number two, beer. First tea, now beer? Oh, wait, no, first beer. The earliest recorded consumption of beer was in China 9,000 years ago. I could kiss these people. Two of my favorite beverages. That's it, I'm moving back in time to ancient China. Only this beer wasn't exactly the same as the kind of beer we would think of made of barley. They used rice, hawthorn, honey, and grapes to make their beer. This 4 or 5% alcohol was mentioned in inscriptions from the Shang Dynasty, so that would be 1600 BC to 1046 BC. But pottery from around 7000 BC contains traces of this same kind of alcohol. That's before even the Egyptian pharaohs. And three and a half to 4000 years before the Sumerians created the Western modern day interpretation of beer. The liquid was known as Zhu in Chinese and is often used as a spiritual offering to the heavens and the earth or to ancestors. And you know what? It still is, baby. Number one, paper money. The Zhaozi currency was the first time in history we used paper money. The stacks, the wad, the dough, the shkarol, the Benjamins, the Bordens, dead presidents, and the bread. There's no greater feeling than walking into a mall with a wad of cash, is there? JC Penny, here I come. Well, we have ancient China to thank for that. Well, sort of. Coins and metal were still more common and used for hundreds of more years before we started printing. In reality, the paper makes more sense. Before printing, coins could have been manipulated into making doubles or counterfeit. There wasn't a press yet. But with paper, it could be issued certain identifiers and used for certain things. The problem with the Jiaozi money is that it wasn't backed by anything. So it did cause a little bit of uh, what my generation knows too much, inflation. Number 10, grid-based cities. Next time you find yourself at 2nd Avenue and East 59th Street in New York and get into a car accident or are just enjoying the pleasures of Manhattan traffic, you can thank the Romans. Also, shout out to New York. Chetty loves you. What's going on, New York? How you doing? How you doing? No, how you doing? Yes, it was the Romans who began to develop cities and Rome into a grid-like pattern. In a time before roads full of cars, this makes sense. I mean, come on, how much space and traffic can horses and carriages take up? There are benefits to building your city in a grid pattern. It's walkable, easy to navigate, and you can size up the city pretty well. I play a lot of city builders. I like those games, those games are fun. SimCity. Trust me, I would know. This is also true so long as your city isn't packed with skyscrapers and bumper to bumper in rideshare vehicles. You kind of lose the plot when you get to a big city like that, but they started it, there it was. Number nine, arches. For the dudes who like feet, this one is not for you. Ain't those kind of arches, dude, sorry. Today I'm talking about Roman arches. Someone somewhere in Rome discovered that the shape of an arch actually makes for a very effective uh, building. I know, who would have thought? You can tell because as soon as they were discovered, they were popping up everywhere, like pimples on prom night. Simple geometry makes complex architecture. Arches can handle their loads, even if they are overbearing. And trust me, I've seen some overbearing loads in my lifetime. Where's an arch when you need one? The arch simply is a mainstay of Roman architecture and a small part of what made up of the magnificent constructions. I'll get more of that on later. You'll see, you'll see. Number eight, sewers and sanitation. Apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, and the fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? 
Man, I love that quote. Both historical and comical. It's kind of like, I think that's why you guys like to watch me sometimes, right? We'll try. One, we'll see. Best of both worlds. Well, it's true. The Romans understood how important sanitation was. While perhaps not the first invention of such, they are the inventors of the modern use of such. The Mediterranean is gorgeous, but after a diet of fish from the sea and pasta, well, you gotta go. One of the ways Romans did this was public bathrooms, except it's more like a room where you and the whole city just do what must be done in front of one another. There's no, no stalls, it's kind of just lined up. It's kind of, it's, it's a little gross, a little bit. So yes, the sanitation was a great thing, but going together all at once? Well, uh, I don't have to tell you how bad that was. Especially, you know, public washrooms, you know they can be bad. Especially with open stalls, that just can't, mm. Ah, no good. Number seven, roads. All roads lead to Rome. This might sound very stupid, but to us, the Roman roads did change history. Given that there's still Roman roads out there right now that have survived 2,000 years of climate and use, it's pretty impressive. And then there's our modern roads that give in after a couple bad winters in your grandfather's boat of a Buick creating puddles every time he breaks. The roads considered of layers of rock and dirt that made for a sturdy road. Hundreds of civilians, horses, traders, carts traveling back and forth on Roman roads every day. Imagine how hard it would be to get to the next city over with no car and no road. That's some rough traveling. Too bad we couldn't have them back or build our roads today. I've got some denarius for the next Roman to build me a road, baby. Come on, come on over, build us a road. Number six, aqueducts. These are honestly amazing feats of engineering. Even today, it's, it's, it's a lot of bricks to lay down for a little bit of water. So the question is, you build a very busy city, probably the most impressive city and cities of the ancient era. You need two things for all those folks, water and food. Okay, well, we can do farms outside the city walls, no problem, but Water, we need people to drink water and those, those farms need water too. How do you get water to a busy city center? Aqueducts, basically a long bridge that connects freshwater springs to the fountains of the city, essentially running water. This for the time was very incredible. Hundreds if not thousands of years ahead of their time. To be able to walk into town and drink fresh water was a luxury, one that Rome might have taken for granted. Now every home has running water, and it's great and we all love it. You love tap water, I love tap water. Where's my Brita? Number five, Roman numerals. Attack of the math. Look, I don't wanna give the Romans too much credit, but Gosh darn, I guess they did a lot. Sure, we don't use their numbers in regular life today, but they still appear in places once in a while. Uh, like the Star Wars movies, they use them. Uh, they have titles and, and names, and, and, and sometimes just to confuse students when trying to tell time. Sometimes the clocks have Roman numerals on them for some reason. For once, that was something actually I didn't struggle with in school. Who would have thought? The Roman numeral system is based on certain letters representing ones and tens until it gets into larger denominations and more letters get, get thrown in. Basically, anything from one to 1,000, you're good. You're doing great. After that, eh, you're gonna need some more papyrus. I had enough trouble with algebra and adding some letters to my numbers in math class, but now my numbers are actually just letters? Whoa, I don't think, uh, I don't think so, cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I didn't sign up for that, nope. I'll be in drama class, much easier. I'm not going to math class, I'm going to drama class, nope. Number four, the Julian calendar. Imagine being such a mighty and powerful leader that you get a calendar named after you. Yes, the Julian calendar is named after Julius Caesar, the man, the myth, the legend. You might be thinking to yourself, well, we don't use that calendar today, do we? Well, as it turns out, we do. Most of the world goes by the Gregorian calendar from Pope Gregory, which was a revision of the Julian calendar. Yeah, I know, I was surprised too, I didn't know that. Wait till you hear where the months of August and July come from. Your boy Augustus, and yet again, Julius Caesar. Yes, the dude made a whole month for himself and just threw it in there. Okay, now hear me out, we're gonna break, we're gonna break some stuff down here, ready? Octa, Nova, and Deca are all prefixes for eight, nine, and 10, right? Just like October, November, and December are the eighth, ninth, and 10th months out of the year. Well, that makes sense. Big prank though, uh, I got gotcha, you, nice try, because after July and August were added, the others got pushed back. It's crazy what you can do with a little power, it's crazy. So now, October, November, December are 10, 11, and 12, they got pushed back. See, it's crazy, you ever wonder that? See, that's how they did it, it makes, I just, I, there's some people like, I actually didn't know that. I open up your mind, brother, that's what I do, that's what I do here. Number three. The Empire Business. I'm in the Empire Business. Yes, all Walter White and Saul Goodman references aside, also 
Good show. Watch it. When one thinks of empires, the Romans just come to mind. Many have come and gone, and others have had bigger and lasted longer. However, none really had the influence and power of the mighty Roman Empire stretching all over the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, and even some parts of the Middle East. Senatus Populus Romanus. She was glorious. Unfortunately, this wouldn't last. Years of corruption in government, war, difficulty in controlling its empire from being too big, and just a lack of communication. Takes a long time to get messages around. And maybe the biggest religious reform led to, to the capital moving east. And the empire being split into east and west, and then those Byzantine guys showed up, and it got a little crazy. There's east and west, and then some Ottomans. It, whoa, whoa, what happened? Yeah, it didn't last forever. Sucks. Number two, concrete. There's something in that concrete, and this is related back to the arches I was talking about earlier. See, told you we get there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, told you. None of the gorgeous buildings Rome had ever constructed would be possible without use of their concrete. Using volcanic ash and lime mixed with a base aggregate made for a very tough and durable solid building material. You can even use this stuff underwater. Sounds like I'm giving you guys a sales pitch. It gets tougher as time goes on, and some Roman sites with buildings made of this miracle stuff have little to no wear on the material itself. That's pretty impressive. I spent countless hours awake in the late hours of the night watching dudes make Roman concrete. Am I a builder? No. Am I a tinkerer? No. Should I have been in bed? Yes. However you look at it, it's just cool stuff. There's some cool videos out there. It's really cool stuff. It like lasts forever. Like the, the buildings are actually gone, but like the concrete itself, dude, you could use it again. It's no like it's it's insane. It's just where do we go wrong? Number one, entertainment. Show business. <laughs> After bread and wine comes entertainment. Okay, no, they didn't invent fun, because Romans probably had a different idea of fun than we do. All you have to do is look at the Colosseum and some of the other large sports event centers they built. Yeah, it wasn't just the Colosseum in Rome, but across the Roman Empire, there was more. Why? Because they needed to be entertained. Gladiators, lions, fights, you know, you know what was going on. There's always been actors, storytellers, but it was the Romans who made it theatrical. If you ask any acting teacher, that's what'll tell you what counts. The theatrics. Kicking off the list at number 10, burials. This list is full of interesting objects that Neanderthals created, like tools or weapons, that kind of stuff. But the idea of burying your loved one after they've passed on, well, that had to start somewhere, didn't it? Ancient Egyptians arguably did it the best. The rich were buried with their treasure and goods because they believed that death on our world was just the start. There was another life afterwards and they would take their treasure and good stuff with them. Bye. Not leaving anything for you, I'm taking all this with me. Neanderthals didn't figure out how to build tombs yet or how to rule for decades. Studies done in Western Europe suggest that Neanderthals would sometimes bury their dead and leave flowers. Flowers or a grave marker of some sort. Pollen was found in Northern Iraq's Shandir Caves. Shandir Cave is a staple when it comes to Neanderthal history. And the fact that flowers were found in the middle of a cave system, some humans and emotions are definitely at play here. This was symbolic thinking. The weather didn't make it easy to collect flowers as well. Loved ones passing during an ice age? Yeah, I'll never complain about an outdoor funeral again. Number nine, glass. Imagine making glass for the first time. You would have thought you were a wizard for sure. I watch glass blowing shows now and it looks like wizardry. Wizardry in 4K. Glass blowing is nuts, they're just like and it's just like a vase all of a sudden. You're like, how did he do that? That's so hot. Glass that was naturally occurring, like obsidian for example, that was around and used during the Stone Age. Man-made glass was first used around 6,000 years ago. Man-made glass, yeah, let's talk about it. Archaeologists are pinning Lebanon, North Syria, and ancient Egypt as the birthplace of synthetic glass. The first use of man-made glass were beads, believe it or not. Imagine being the first person to rock beads. Ah, the confidence. Mid-2000 BC, guy decides to glaze up some beads. What an icon. Now we get to do this. The beads, it's a cool door. Number eight, sharpen stones. Some of the oldest tools in history could be laying in front of you and you would have zero idea. You have no clue. Coming from the shores of Lake Tucana in Kenya, these stone tools date back to around three million years ago. Yeah, these are predating the tools before that I mentioned by like 700,000 years. They seem to predate humans in the Homo genus as well, so that's interesting, that's kind of concerning. The volcanic ash and minerals around these sharpened stones date back that far, millions of years old. Stones in history can get a little dirty, to say the least. Not all these ideas that involve stones or sharpened stones are the best. French anthropologist Philippe Charlier shared toilet hygiene history in the British Medical Journal. Perhaps one of the most intriguing parts explains how these flat terracotta discs were found in ancient Greek sites and they had residue on them. They had a certain residue on these sharp rocks. They used to 
<laughs> with these stones, yeah. They also discovered a Greek cup which said three stones are enough to wipe one's arse. Three? I don't know, that's at least five, my friend. Greeks would use stones to wipe. Never take the go for granted ever again. Number seven, axes. The Neolithic period, also referred to as the New Stone Age, introduced us to many vital tools that we still use today. Like an axe, for example. Around 10,000 BC, Neanderthals moved from being these small hunter-gatherer type groups to these much larger settlements. In order to do so, you had to clear a lot of land. Humans evolved at this point in history because that's when we went from flaking stones to grinding them down entirely. We put a little more elbow grease in in order to clear those trees out to build a settlement or two or three or five. Neolithic axes were found at sites in England and Denmark. This one here was found in great condition, alarmingly great condition, like look at this thing. It was uncovered during archeological surveys for a tunnel project in Denmark. Imagine finding a 5,500 year old ax in the middle of your shift. And in case you're wondering, the lack of oxygen in the surrounding clay is the reason why the wooden handle was preserved so well. It almost seems like it was placed there as some type of offering. My first thought is that it's for sure belonging to the Odin Thor family. I don't know, it's, it's placed downwards, you know what I mean? No one touch it. Number six, spears and arrows. Perhaps one of the most vital inventions, one we for sure still use today, always, of course. Arrows and spears were a necessity when it came to hunting, and for people in the Stone Age, all they needed really was wood. They would carve a leaf shape at the end or a triangle at the tip, and then they were mainly used by riders or barefoot hunters. But when it came to hunting, you didn't want to get too close to your prey, or else the wrong team could be claiming victory and eat the other for lunch. Get what I'm saying? So their solution was to huck these spears instead, or make really tiny ones that you can throw or brr, shoot. The oldest bows in history are from 9000 BC. They're the home guard bows. They're found in Northern Europe all the way back from the Mesolithic period. The oldest spears, however, they come from Germany around 400,000 years ago, and they're actually the oldest wooden artifacts ever in history. Imagine being the first person to make a spear. Forget iPhones, a spear? That's a big deal. Number five, flutes. We love a solid flutist. They're flutists, right? Flutest? Uh, dude, I've always wanted to play the flute. Pied Piper, that guy is daring, that guy is wild. He runs around town and plays the jazz flute all day long in tights. Of course I want to be like that, mostly. He's got some flaws. But who is the first person to bust out We Three Kings? Who do we have to blame for all those horrible recorder classes in elementary school? I was the one kid next to you, you're like, drain the spit, it's not on properly. Cover your, use that pinky, cover your thing up. The first instrument known to man was most likely our vocal cords, but the second instrument were the flutes of Glycine Coastal Cave. They're the oldest musical instruments that have ever been discovered. They were made from bird bone and the ivory of a mammoth. Yeah, so that's an indication how old they are. They made music out of mammoth ivory. That's old. Brass? Like, no, 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 we haven't found that yet. Number four, paintings. Yeah, why not? Let's include art into this mix. Who was the first person to create art? The Lascaux Caves have been dubbed the prehistoric Sistine Chapel. These cave paintings are from 17,000 years ago and they're beautiful. But if you're thinking about sneaking down there to write Jordan was here, well, you better think again. The cave was opened originally in 1948, but due to carbon dioxide levels and sweat from visitors and just people breathing and being around, it was closed in 1963. You can't be breathing on our prehistoric paintings. Get your morning dad breath out of here, sir. We don't want that. Look how beautiful it is. It's really nice. <sighs> Learning about our history is challenging, but it's slowly fading away. We're breathing on it all day long. But these caves in France are not home to the oldest paintings in the world, believe it or not. Altamira Cave in Spain houses cave paintings from 35,000 years ago. The paintings were in such great condition that at first scientists doubted that they were the real deal from that long ago. But in 1902, they were marked as the real deal. These ochre and charcoal images are the most well-preserved on the planet. Meanwhile, I'm over here still drawing the sun in the corner of my page. Number three. Blades. Around 80,000 years ago, the first ever five o'clock shadow appeared. And it wasn't my family, we, didn't, we don't have those. An upper Paleolithic stone tool tradition came from Neanderthals and also the first modern human. It's a big deal. This method here was to shave up your face so you're not, you know, eating your own mustache for dinner. And it was entirely new to the game. During this process, Neanderthals would often break off these sharp flakes from the core of a large stone and then use those chips as blades. Horrible, just imagining that. The Aurignacian culture, appropriately named after the French village of Aurignac, where Neanderthal remains were found back in 1860, this culture is the first modern human in Europe. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, we had to use seashells. And when I say seashells to get rid of hair, I don't mean they would you know, glide across the skin or anything like that. They would use two shells, then use them together as tweezers. Yeah, one by one. 
Seashells, can you imagine? That's horrible. Can you hear that? That's the sound of our ancestors plucking their unibrow. Sounds painful, right? Ah, uh, yes, it was. Trapping clamshells were later used in the 19th century because we realized that they're flat enough we could probably just swipe off the hair. It saved a lot of time. Still horrible, but we saved a lot of time. We figured it out. Number two, the wheel. One of the greatest inventions of all time, and now all we want is hover cars. How disrespectful, we just got this thing. The wheel, the idea of the wheel is unlike any other. See, most inventors are inspired by nature. Planes, submarines, bullet trains, all has something to do with nature, bird beaks, flying, underwater, all that crap. Nothing in nature resembles a wheel at all. The closest thing really are tumbleweeds and dung beetles. My favorite thing to mention on this uh, channel, the poop rollers. Potter wheels were found from Mesopotamia around 5,500 years ago. Now it's hard to pinpoint who used the wheel first and where, I mean, given the fact that it was that long ago, but the front runners so far aside from Mesopotamia are the Tripoli people of modern Ukraine because the word wheel literally is derived from their language, but the wheelbarrow may have appeared in ancient Greece around 600 BCE. They say you can't reinvent the wheel, but I feel like you can. At least this early in time, I feel like we did. Number one, fire. I mean, next to the wheel, this one was, you know, it's pretty important, I'd say. When was fire first used in history? Well, a study done in 2011 was published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science, and it showed that Neanderthals were firebenders. Not really, no. They were just, after carefully examining over 140 fireplace sites in Europe, the University of Colorado Boulder found some stone artifacts and charcoal dating back to 400,000 years ago. Now, of course, these fireplaces were used to cook meals, but at the same time, tools were created during this process. Melting things and moving them around, kind of like glass blowing, heat makes things come to life. Neanderthals would use something called pitch. Pitch was made by burning the bark of birch trees. It allowed them to attach stones to wooden shafts, which is a pretty big deal when it came to hammers and tools. Inventing glue is one thing, but doing it while you're working the barbecue? Whose dad was that? That's impressive, that's so impressive. Guys making tools while making lunch. Number 10, extinction. Neanderthal history dates back to around 430,000 years ago. We've always thought that their extinction was caused by some sort of event, some catastrophic wipeout of some sorts, you name it. And we're trying to pinpoint it every day, not every day, but you get it. There's a new Netflix documentary called Ancient Apocalypse where Graham Hancock explains this very event. What wiped out early humans? And rather, what's left of them? Very recently, a human tooth was discovered in a cave in southern France. Now this tooth in question is from 54,000 years ago. Now up until this point we always thought Neanderthals went extinct around 40,000 years ago when modern humans started to roll in. But this new discovery could mean that the two species may have coexisted at the same time. Imagine that you're going to work you see a Neanderthal you're like hey what's up this is an odd 10,000 years cool. Did modern humans wipe out Neanderthals? Maybe, I mean probably. Are homo sapiens to blame for the extinction of Neanderthals? That would be crazy, imagine that. Meanwhile, I'm over here like, hey, hit that thumbs up button, cheers. Species are wiping out each other, this is crazy. Number nine, craftsmen. It doesn't matter how far back you go, art will always be around in some way, shape, or form. Literally, Neanderthal craftsmen would carry with them a pouch and it would basically be a vandalism pouch. They could just go around and draw anything they wanted. And inside of it, it includes lithic flakes, sharp rock flakes basically to cut anything at any time. You had with them scrapers as well, which would be used to cut animal meat or carve wood. Pressure tools were also in there as well to sharpen said other tools. Just the first ever tool belt, essentially. Now, Neanderthals would use hard rock napping and use striking techniques, and sometimes they would carve art. Neanderthal carvings were discovered in Unicorn Cave over in Germany recently. Archaeologists found 50,000 year old deer bone with patterns carved into it with said tools. So either these guys were bored or they were expressing themselves via art. Number eight. Food supply. Hunting looks challenging today, let alone thousands of years ago. I'm sure a crossbow helps, but back then, not so easy. Neanderthals would of course have to hunt in order to eat and survive, but just what did they eat? Hardened tartar hinted at their diet, and that diet being mussels, dolphin, seal, and tons of plants. Now this came to light after part of a seal's jaw was discovered in a vanguard cave in Gibraltar. Now the jaw in question had man-made cut marks. Marks from tools that I mentioned earlier. So now we have a full picture. Now we can put a date on it. Number seven, the Pit of Bones. Ah, the Pit of Bones, classic, great name. Located in Northern Spain. Yeah, first of all, what a horrible, scary name that is. Imagine pitching this to the wife 
for a family trip? Yeah, we're going to the Pit of Bones. Grab your sandals, it's gonna be great. Since 1976, well over 6,000 human fossils have been collected from the Pit of Bones. They found around 28 individual Neanderthals in total, so maybe the Pit of Bones is actually a great name after all. Kinda nails it, I guess. The skeletons date back to around 430,000 years ago. Now, in terms of facial features, these are for sure Neanderthals. We can confirm them. Neanderthal lineage confirmed. Very old, that's so old, I can't even imagine. Number six, spears and arrows. Perhaps one of the most vital inventions, and one that we for sure still use today, is that of arrows and spears. They were a necessity, of course, back then when it came to hunting, and for people in the Stone Age, well, all they needed was wood, really. They would carve a leaf shape or a triangle at the tip, our modern day arrow, and they were used mainly by raiders or barefoot hunters. But when it came to hunting, you didn't want to get too close to your prey, right? Or else the wrong team would be claiming victory and then eating the other for lunch. So their solution was to throw these spears or make really tiny ones. One of two. You can either javelin somebody really hard or hang back and you know just shoot a big dude with an arrow. One of the two. It's gonna be a lose-lose probably. The oldest bows in history are from 9000 BC. Can you believe that? And they're home guard bows. And they're found in Northern Europe all the way from the Mesolithic period. The oldest spears, however, they come from Germany around 400,000 years ago. They're actually the oldest wooden artifacts in history. Imagine being the first person to make a spear. Forget iPhones, a spear? Buddy, you're a genius. Number five, medicine. You can only imagine the various injuries Neanderthals would have, right? Hunting down a mammoth or a bison three times the size of you, yeah, odds are you're gonna get a bruise or two. More than fair. So what did Neanderthals do at this point? Is that what the pile of bones is for? I'm starting to connect this, that makes more sense. God, that's dark. How did Neanderthals live for so long without a pharmacy, right? All that yelling, no halls. Are you kidding? My throat hurts doing this list already. Neanderthal medical skills are pretty similar to what our ancestors did. Herbal remedies, that's it, right? It changes your life. They manage fevers, but when the pain got too bad, chewing on a specific tree may have helped tolerate all that pain. Yeah, 4,000 years before penicillin, Neanderthals were chewing on aspirin. Number four, forbidden friends. Last caught cave paintings date back to some 17,000 years ago, and a lot of the art seen on the walls of the cave art that depicts animals. It's mostly pretty much all animals. It's beautiful. About 900 of them, with just over 600 being recently identifiable. There are cattle, bison, some wild cats, bears, birds, you name it, but there are no reindeer at all. What happened, right? Did they just forget about this one specific animal out of 900, although they ate reindeer meat almost every day? Well, it took a long time to realize, but our best guess as to why they were missing from all these works of art is because these animals are ones that they never caught. Yeah, these are animals that they would dream about, right? They were always afar, just running away. They could never hunt or catch them because at this time they were too fast or too strong. Plus, at this time, they didn't have certain weapons or tools available yet. More than fair, I would much rather draw a bison than have to tackle one, you know what I mean? Number three, more art. Okay, here's where we're at with Neanderthals and art. First of all, we don't have an actual representational version of their art, but we do have symbolism, which is, some would argue the same thing, that's pretty close. And just as fascinating, really. Especially when they look like this, when they look like a masterpiece in a cave. These are eagle talons. They're about 130,000 years old, and they're found at the Krapina Neanderthal site in Croatia. And researchers believe that they were part of a jewelry set, like earrings or a part of a necklace, something like that. I couldn't even make this now with a YouTube tutorial, let alone 130,000 years ago. This is mind blowing. <laughs> Number two, flutes. Music has been in the air for quite a long time now, and Neanderthals enjoyed a flute every now and then, it seems. Yeah, they weren't playing We Three Kings or anything like that, but they were making music as early as 50,000 years ago. Incredible, I still can't even whistle 50,000 years later. The first instrument known to man was most likely our vocal cords, but the second instrument were the flutes of Guys in Cluster Cave. They're the oldest musical instruments that have ever been discovered. They're made from bird bone and ivory of a mammoth. Yeah, so if it's any indication how old they are, they made music out of mammoth ivory. Yeah, take that, Skrillex. Finally, number one, glass. Imagine making glass. Imagine being like, oh yeah, my dad makes glass. I don't know, he's a magician, I guess. Imagine making glass for the first time. You know what I mean? Like, you're a wizard. Even if you made glass now, I would think you're a wizard. Glass blowing shows on Netflix. I'm like, you're all wizards. How do you do this? 
Glass that was naturally occurring, like obsidian for example, that was around and used during the Stone Age. Man-made glass was first used around 6,000 years ago. Archaeologists are pitting Lebanon, North Syria, ancient Egypt, all as the birthplace of synthetic glass. The first use of man-made glass were beads. Yeah, imagine being the first person to rock beads. Ah, oh, the confidence. A bead door? An ancient bead door? You would be a genius. Mid 2000s BC, a guy glazes up some beads. What an icon. Like I said, art comes in many different shapes and sizes. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have Greek fire. Greek fire is essentially the primitive form of napalm, and it was first created in. Greece, you guessed it. It was used often and efficiently for naval battles during the Byzantine Empire. It was used and worked well for these battles because it was able to not only float on top of the water, but it also was difficult to put out the fire using water. The secrets regarding this substance were guarded so greatly because it was such a powerful weapon at the time, the information on what it was made out of, how it was stored, or how it functioned remain a mystery to this day. The formula to recreate it has been tried many times, but it is currently thought thought that the particular storage and some sort of pressurized delivery system are what played such a huge role in its functionality and ignition, and we have yet to figure out those secrets. In our number 9 spot today we have Roman cement. Concrete is the most commonly used building material in the world, but our current cement, water, sand, rocks, mixture is nothing compared to the original stuff. While our modern concrete was created in the 1700s, there was obviously stuff that was being used before. In fact, Concrete was used quite a bit during antiquity by Egyptians, Assyrians, and Romans. The Romans seemingly used to generate the most, and they are the ones who really perfected the recipe that we just can't seem to replicate now. Apparently, the ancient mixture involved burnt limestone as well as crushed rocks and water, but whatever the heck it was, their structures were a lot more withstanding than ours are now, which has led people to question how do we get that level of hardiness back in our modern day concrete? In our number 8 spot today, we have the Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an extremely mysterious discovery that has stumped researchers ever since it was found. This artifact was found 150 feet below the surface of the Aegean Sea in a shipwreck, and it is the oldest kind of computer ever recorded as it was dated back to the 7th century BC. The author David Childress likened the finding to if they found a jet plane in King Tut's tomb. That's how bizarre this discovery really was. Due to the complexity and oddity of the finding, alien enthusiasts have believed for quite some time that it may have been technology that was passed down from some sort of superior being. This analog computer may have had a ton of uses, and researchers aren't 100% sure about all of the ways it was used, but it is known to have been some sort of astronomical calculator. It was able to predict eclipses and different planetary placements. The mechanism was able to to calculate the position and running time of each planet. How would they have been able to create this without the use of sophisticated astronomical tools? We have been able to recreate this mechanism to see how it functions, but no one is able to tell how it could have possibly been created. In our number 7 spot today we have Mithridate. Mithridate was named after King Mithridate VI who was the king of Pontus. It is said that he was so terribly afraid of being poisoned that he, over the course of 7 years, adapted his body to different poisons. It is also said that after mixing 54 ingredients together, he was able to create Mithridate, which is said to have been a universal antidote to all poisons. The exact formula has of course been lost to time, but historians have said that it was believed the antidote contained opium, chopped vipers, and small amounts of the poisons and their antidotes. The antidote was originally created around 100 BC, and it was actually used by many people for centuries, and even apparently as recently as the 19th century. It is unclear how the recipe entirely disappeared, but despite some best efforts, no one has really been able to recreate it since the last known use. In our number 6 spot today we have Damascus Steel. It's possible that you may have heard of Damascus Steel before, and that is because the name still exists, and it's used in reference to a variety of pattern welded forged steel products, but the modern day stuff just really isn't what it used to be. Historically, Damascus Steel was discovered quite a long time ago, and it was used to make swords in the Middle East. It is said that these swords had the ability to cut through rock 
rocks, or even completely cut through other swords, which is just absolutely insane. The exact process of how these swords were made has been lost to time, but it is rumored that Wood's steel was imported from Sri Lanka and used in the creation process along with other metals. Somehow the metals were basically weaved together rather than an alloy being created. This is what led to the steel not only being exceptionally strong, but also really flexible, and it is this process that modern day smiths can't seem to exactly replicate. The modern day Damascus products are definitely high quality, gorgeous products, but it seems as though the secrets of the past may hold something even better. In our number 5 spot today we have the Telharmonium. The Telharmonium is regarded as one of the world's first electronic instruments. This instrument was kind of like an organ, but it used wheels to create different synthetic tones. From here the tones would be transmitted over telephone wires with the intention of getting the music broadcast so that people could listen in. Considering the fact that this instrument was created in 1897, that's a pretty cool invention for the time. So the fact that it once existed really is super cool. Unfortunately, however, the idea was taking too much energy from the grid, which led to it being just totally scrapped. Instead of finding out another way to use this instrument or just waiting for technology to advance to a point where this would be able to be used, they just destroyed it. Now, in 2020, not only does the Telharmonium not exist, but there aren't even any recordings of it, so it seems as though this might be one thing that's just lost forever. In our number 4 spot today we have Ulfbert. This mysterious sword has been confusing ever since it was discovered by archaeologists. Experts were able to date this sword back to the Viking era sometime from 800 to 1000 AD, but no one could figure out how this sword was made, especially with what technologies were available at the time. It seemed as though this sword was made using techniques that didn't exist until 800 years later when the industrial revolution happened, so how could it have been made all of that time before. It is said that everything about this sword, from the composition of the metal to the extreme heat needed to forge the blade, it just couldn't have been done at the time, but clearly it was. So how? A blacksmith who tried to recreate the sword only using methods that would have been used at the time explained that he was unable to make it without resorting to more modern technology. In our number 3 spot today we have Nepenthe. If you're a person who's ever had to be subjected to the process that is antidepressant medication, this one might just frustrate you a bit. The ancient Greeks and Romans discovered a lot of things, some of which we use now, and some that seem to have been lost but could have potentially proved to be exceptionally useful to us, and that is exactly what Nepenthe is. Ancient Greeks were known to treat the bereaved with this medicine that seems to have been some sort of a primitive antidepressant. It is said that Nepenthe was known for its ability to chase sorrow away and also to cause forgetfulness. There are many references to this medicinal plant, but at this point we are completely unsure of which modern plant aligns with these ancient descriptions, or if the plant even exists at all anymore. In our number 2 spot today we have Stradivari Violins. If you're a string in instrument enthusiast, then you definitely have heard of the Stradivari family and the instruments created by them. These instruments were created between 1650 and 1750, and they were highly sought after in their day, and even more so now. Apparently these instruments feature an unparalleled sound quality that has been found to be impossible to recreate. The instruments that have survived through to the modern day are now worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, so it is abundantly clear that these instruments are incredibly valuable. Here's the catch though, experts can't agree or figure out what exactly it is that makes them sound so wonderful. Some have speculated that the magnificent sound comes from a fungus that grew in the region, some think that it's the density of the wood, but regardless, no one really knows for sure. At the end of the day, the secrets of the family art were laid to rest with the Stradivari family. In our number 1 spot today we have the Library of Alexandria. This isn't necessarily technology as we now think of the word, but this certainly was one of the greatest losses we've seen. This library is said to have held a collection of over 1 million scrolls, which are said to have been all the written works in the world at the time. The library was founded in 300 BC and it was where the scholars of the time would come to study. When a person visited the library, they needed to give over any books that they had so that they could be copied and added to the collection of the library. It isn't exactly clear what it was that destroyed the library, but rumors range from Julius Caesar accidentally setting it on fire 
to an invasion that set it ablaze. At the end of the day, the building burned and everything in it was destroyed. What was in that building was absolutely priceless, and we can only guess at what kind of secrets it held. Unfortunately, many of what was in the library wasn't written anywhere else, so it's destined to stay a mystery. Number 10. Ancient Telescope The Nimrod Lens It's a 3,000 year old rock crystal lens discovered in modern day Iraq in the mid 1800s. Now, it was discovered quite recently, but back then, this thing was like ancient technology. Today we have the James Webb Space Telescope. 3,000 years ago, they were more advanced than we think. The lens is believed to have been made by a Syrian craftsman sometime around 750 BC. It's the oldest known example right now of a magnifying lens, which is... Sounds kind of nerdy, but that's cool. That's kind of a, one of those facts that makes me go, oh, interesting, I like that. Up until then, everybody was just squinting a lot, really. We didn't have anything to zoom in on. The lens is quite small in size. It's no James Webb, that's for sure. It's around three centimeters in diameter and a focal length of 12 centimeters. So again, not James Webb, but it was something, right? It was anything. The exact purpose of the Nimrod lens is still up for debate. That's still unknown, but it's thought to have been used for decorative or ceremonial purposes, or possibly, hopefully, magnifying things Things to study small objects because man, that's science right there. It's technology. The Nimrod lens is the first example of ancient optical technology. That's cool. Imagine building that. It's crazy. Number nine, the Iron Pillar. Remember when monoliths started to appear all around the world? We were all talking about it for like a month and then we just stopped. What happened with that? That's concerning. This next one rings a similar bell. The Iron Pillar of Delhi. It's a 7.3 meter tall iron column and it's located in the Kitab complex in Delhi, India. Now it went up sometime during the Gupta period. So sometime around the third and 4th century AD, and it's been standing for over 1,600 years without rusting or corroding at all, which is impressive. That and like the Egyptian pyramids, we have no idea how this happened. The column is notable for its high quality iron compositions and advanced forging techniques used to create it. We still can't figure out just how that was done considering how long ago it was made. The iron pillar is also covered in several inscriptions in the Sanskrit language, which is pretty exciting, providing valuable ancient history about the Gupta Empire, and also, again, in remarkable condition, which is super rare. The pillar attracts visitors from all over the world. Wanna go see a pillar? I kinda wanna go see a pillar now. That'd be a crazy trip. Number eight, the Antikythera mechanism. Computers today, we can, we can fit them in our pockets, but ancient Greek analog computers, apparently you can also fit those in your pockets. Who knew? The Antikythera mechanism was used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses for calendrical and astrological purposes. That sounds scientific, wow. It was discovered in 1901 in the Antikythera shipwreck, hence its name, and it's estimated to have been built around 150 and 100 BC. Now the mechanism consists of at least 30 bronze gears and it was operated by turning a crank. This is again like ancient technology, this is amazing. It's rusty and full of barnacles now, but back then in its prime, this mechanism would accurately display the positions of the sun, the moon, and planets on specific dates, as well as predict solar and lunar eclipses. Some guy in the back's like, spoilers, it's tomorrow, told you. The mechanism is considered a remarkable technological achievement for its time and provides valuable insights into the history of ancient Greek astronomy and technology, all in one rusty box right there. Think of what we haven't found yet, you know what I mean? I'm nervous, I'm so nervous. Humans are quite advanced. Number seven, ancient seismoscope. Zhang Hang seismoscope is an ancient Chinese instrument that was used to detect and measure earthquakes, and it looked pretty badass. I'm not gonna lie, this thing looks pretty cool. It was invented by renowned scientist, mathematician, and astronomer Zhang Hang. It was made during the Han Dynasty around 132 CE. The seismoscope consisted of a bronze vessel that rested on the back of a bronze dragon, a dragon, with eight open mouth toads positioned beneath it. Yeah, it's scientific, but it's also a beautiful instrument, right? Like I said, it's badass. So when an earthquake would happen, a mechanism inside the vessel would trigger the release of the ball from one of the toad's mouths, indicating the direction of the earthquake. He'd be like, nah, that way. And everyone would be like, okay, cool. Let's go this way then. Today it's a little different. Today it's, it's not, it's fun. It's just graphs and charts. Looks like some avatar technology, whatever. No toads puking up any balls in any direction, so. Ergo boring. Number six, the Baghdad battery. Also known as the Parthian battery. This is an ancient device that would go back to 248 BC. Why am I doing this? Am I Italian? Am I Steve Jobs? I'm walking around like, ah yes, I invented this. Look at my loose wrist here. Why do I, I gotta keep these down. Keep these at bay here. The battery consists of a clay jar, a copper cylinder, and an iron rod. All of which were found together in what is now modern day Iraq. It's believed that the device was used to generate an electric current by filling the jar with an acidic liquid like vinegar, or wine. I sound like Bill Nye the science guy right now, but then they would insert copper and iron components after, and then 
They would make electricity. They would make, I don't know, t here, Tony Stark would make this. I don't know, it's crazy. The purpose of the Baghdad battery is still unknown, which is fascinating. I won't be able to sleep at night now, but it's thought to have been used for electroplating or medicine or as a religious artifact. And today we're like, well, we have no idea. This is the stuff that I love. Old, ancient, like this sounds like something from Breath of the Wild that I would find. Number five. Ancient Greek fire. Okay, this one's pretty epic. It's not, uh, I mean, it's horrible. It's pretty rough history here, but definitely interesting nonetheless. Greek fire was used by the Eastern Roman Empire from the 7th to the 12th century. Now, the formula for Greek fire was a closely guarded secret, which is like so villainous, but it's believed to have contained petroleum, quicklime, and other combustible substances, all in one soup, just a big hot mess. Something you don't wanna drop, really, ideally. Greek fire was delivered using a flamethrower-like device on a boat called a siphon, and it was capable of igniting on water, making it a very reliable weapon against any ship out there. Yeah, they would shoot hot fire through a giant syringe at enemy ships. Ancient history is cool, it's impressive, but it's also, most of the time, brutal. It's disgusting, my God. Number four, mechanical clocks. Look, we all love an hourglass, all right? I love an hourglass. Playing a board game with the family, you aggressively flip that thing down, no better feeling, right? Tick tock, sands are swirling. But why don't we have an hourglass anymore? Why don't we use those? Those are pretty sweet, it's a pretty amazing invention. Let's talk about those for a bit. During the medieval period, the invention of mechanical clocks revolutionized timekeeping and replaced the use of hourglasses. One guy's like, what? I love these though. That's me, I'm the guy. Mechanical clocks were first invented in Europe in the 13th century and they were initially used in public spaces like churches, town squares, stuff like that. These early clocks relied on the energy generated by falling weights to power their movements. Yeah, you're not gonna have one of these next to your bed. Not for a while, at least. Mechanical clocks allowed for more precise timekeeping and helped standardize time across different regions, but back then it was scary. Back then it was weights and big things bonging around above your head. It's like, what time is it? I don't know. The only one we got. Number three. The blast furnace. This one was also quite important. All these are pretty important, but this one's, you know, wasn't used to destroy a human being, so it's good. The blast furnace. It's a medieval invention that revolutionized the production of iron, which is so key. We love that over here in Steamville with iron everywhere. I don't know, there's trains literally all around us. It was first introduced in Europe during the 14th century and it quickly became a game changer. The furnace's design allowed for a higher temperatures and more efficient use of fuel, leading to increased iron production and most importantly, lower costs, which yeah, blacksmiths love this, you know, they hate this one trick. The blast furnace would also enable the production of higher quality iron that was suitable in wider ranges of applications, which again, we love that. We love when iron just stays in one spot. Usually it's how we like our iron. We made better, faster iron. I don't know, what a day. It sounds like a Daft Punk song. Harder, better, faster iron. This invention spread across Europe, of course, with many regions becoming iron production hot zones. A lot of blacksmiths in the area, a lot of a lot of beards. Single blacksmiths in your area. Just swipe, here we go. Number two, the printing press. I'm not a fan of homework, but I get it. It's gotta be done sometime. The printing press, of course we have to include this. This is a revolutionary invention during, again, the medieval period that allowed for the mass production of books and pamphlets. I love pamphlets, thank God. Love me a good pamphlet. I love flipping things only thrice and then closing it, that's it. No more than three. Invented by Johannes Gutenberg in the mid 15th century, the printing press could reproduce text more quickly and Again, it was pretty cheap considering what came before. You had to pay a guy to do everything. That's crazy. You gotta listen to him all day? No, you gotta feed him? No. This had quite the impact on society and enabled wider access to knowledge, the spread of ideas, and it contributed to the growth of literacy, which again, we love that. Still leading towards that one. The printing press played a key role in the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation. And it may or may not have helped lay the foundation for the modern world. So I guess, yeah, we could put this close to number one, I would say, or number two is pretty good. And finally, number one, flutes. Yeah, we're ending on flutes, the best, right? We had to learn it for three years in school. Why? Couldn't tell you. No idea, we had to do it though. Music has been in the air for a very, very long time. Neanderthals enjoyed a flute every now and then. Who would have thunk? They weren't playing We Three Kings like us, you know, but they were making music as early as 50,000 years ago, which is just baffling. The first instrument known to man was most likely our vocal cords, but the second instrument were the flutes of Geist and Closer Cave. They're the oldest musical instruments ever that have ever been discovered, period. They were made from bird bone and the ivory of a mammoth. Yeah, if that's any indication how old they are, they made music out of mammoth ivory. Again, I still can't play the recorder. I, I never learned, I was useless. My fingers were too long. I'd always like slip off the holes. I got Jack Skellington fingers. I can't play a recorder, no way. Number 10, Greek fire. You know what's scary? Fire. You know what's even scarier than that? 
Someone who can shoot streams of fire at you. While some people love the smell of napalm in the morning, they are usually the people doing the firing. And it wasn't just shirtless Americans who did the firing, no. Somehow, the ancient Greeks also used a proto-napalm that would be used against other ships in naval warfare. The substance would apparently cling to flesh and was impossible to extinguish with water. What puzzles us is that the recipe for Greek fire was never told to anyone. It was a secret on the same level as the Krabby Patty secret formula. People have experimented with different ingredients that the Byzantine Empire had access to. The Mythbusters, my favorite scientists, used naphtha, which is made from a light crude oil, mixed with pine resin, and they burned down a ship in a few seconds. I'm sure at the time, people thought that those who used Greek fire were wielding the power of a god or something. Number 9. Damascus Steel While off on the Crusades, a lot of Europeans came into contact with things they'd never seen before. Spices, for example. Please cut it with the bland food, guys. Please. Another thing they saw were warriors who wielded blades that could slice through floating handkerchiefs, but also bend to ridiculous degrees without breaking. These blades were made from what was called Damascus steel. But for some reason, we actually have no idea what these blades were actually made of, or what the process for making it could even be. Some people think it could have been made by mixing iron with plant matter, which could have given the kind of flexibility I'll never have. But we don't know what plant matter, and we don't even know for sure that's how it was done. The best guess is that it was made of crucible steel, which, <laughs> can I just say, sounds really cool. But that's just a theory. Uh, wait, that's the wrong channel. Number eight, the Voynich Manuscript. This may be a little bit insensitive of me, but the drawings in the Voynich Manuscript kind of look like the same things I used to doodle in my notebooks when I stopped paying attention in class. I definitely never wrote like that, though. The Voynich Manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, who was a Polish collector and bookseller in 1912 when he acquired the manuscript. It's from around the 15th century and is written in this really cool looking code with strange drawings. The font actually kind of reminds me of the font from Lord of the Rings. Does anyone else see that or am I, am I weird? A lot of the pictures drawn in the book seem to be plants. But then you get the random page that has a string of what looks like pregnant women and you're back to square one. I don't know, but I'm still going with somebody's encrypted notebook with fun doodles for when they're bored. Number seven, Ulfbort swords. How do you make a sword that your society did not have the technology for? That is an excellent question, and it is the question that Viking Ulfbert swords pose to historians. The problem with Ulfbert swords is that the technology required for making them did not appear until about 800 years later. Now the thing that kind of bothers me with that assumption is we are assuming that it didn't appear until 800 years later because we haven't found evidence to prove otherwise, except for the swords themselves. In Viking society, a lot of stuff was made with wood and other degradable things, which makes it really hard to know too much about the ancient peoples. What's really interesting is how a Viking sword bearing an Arabic inscription was found. Perhaps these swords were made with Damascus steel, the recipe for which was given to the Vikings through trade, maybe? We need more evidence to know for sure. Number six, Baghdad battery. Do you know how a battery works? Allow me to explain. I don't really know. Um, what I do know is that it involves chemistry. Google tells me the chemical reactions in a battery involve the flow of electrons from one material to another through an external circuit. I don't know. We often think of batteries as a moderately modern invention. And for the most part, that's true. But then there's the Baghdad battery. The Baghdad battery, or batteries because there are a bunch of them, were discovered outside modern day Baghdad in Iraq in 1936. And it's basically a clay pot with a copper cylinder inside of it. Inside the copper cylinder was an iron rod held in place with asphalt. Now, if you take an electrolyte liquid like like even grape juice or something, and put it in the pot, the pots now become batteries, generating about two volts of electricity. The crazy thing about this is that they were found in a Paleolithic village, which is like the Stone Age. We have absolutely no idea what the electricity was used for, but probably because it's fun to administer minor electrical shocks to yourself, right? Number five, Iron Pillar. The Iron Pillar of Delhi is well, it's pretty self-explanatory, actually. It's, it's an iron pillar, which is more than 16 
hundred years old. I leave my bike out in the rain for like three days and it's a rusty pile of junk. But this thing has been out in the open for all those years and it never gained a single speck of rust. How the heck is that possible? I don't know. None of us actually know. Some people think it might have to do with the climate in Delhi. As if it was just in the perfect spot to not rust. But then others think it has to do with the phosphorus and absence of sulfur and manganese in the iron. Plus its size. I don't know, my pea sized brain won't be able to tell you the answer, but it certainly is a puzzling one. Number 4. Chinese Seismoscope At first glance, I can confidently say that I would not assume this was the seismoscope. It was basically a big old pot with a bunch of dragons around the outside that would symbolize each direction on a compass. And when an earthquake would happen, the dragon that represented the direction the quake came from would spit out a ball into a bronze toad's mouth. Now, apart from bronze dragons spitting balls into bronze frog mouths, this is an extremely sophisticated device. And absolutely no one knows how it works. We have guesses about what could do it, but this thing can detect the direction of earthquakes 400 miles away. That's insane. And they still made it into a work of art. I am impressed. Good show. Good show. Number three. Antikythera Mechanism I kinda hate when people think complex things in history had to be because of aliens. Just because these people were ancient does not mean that they were stupid. They just didn't have the vast amounts of shared knowledge we have now. Then you show me the Antikythera Mechanism and all I can think is aliens. This thing was probably built around the 2nd century BC and it had the capability of calculating and displaying things like the phases of the moon and the lunisolar calendar. Which is just crazy. We know that people did study that, and gear based tech like this had actually been a thing for a long, long time before. We think of computers as modern things, but there were machines capable of doing calculations before electricity and computer chips. Some of us have to start giving these ancient civilizations more credit instead of just jumping to aliens or to time travel. Number two Roman dodecahedron. 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 Oh, what? Oh, yeah, sorry, I got a video to make. Uh, here, look at this thing. This is a Roman dodecahedron. And guess what? We have absolutely no idea what it's supposed to do. But we do know that Europe has tons of these, and they all date back to the Roman era. Like all dodecahedra, it has 12 sides, and each side has a differently sized hole. They also have strange bulbs on each corner. They would range in sizes too, being anywhere from 4 to 11 centimeters. I'm honestly stumped about what it could be. People have theorized they could be uh, paperweights, toys, candle holders, dice, or even a thing used to measure finger sizes for rings. Let me know what you think it could be. Number 1. Easter Island If you thought this point was going to be about the huge statues on the island, well think again. While those statues are a mystery all on their own, this point is actually going to be about Rongo Rongo. What the heck is Rongo Rongo? Well, Rongo Rongo is possibly a form of ancient writing. What makes it stand apart is that it is almost nothing like any other form of writing from any other culture in the world, at least that we know of. Look at this really handy dandy rock that's covered in the writing. Can you make anything out of it? Apparently, the symbols are based on Polynesian religious motifs. My brain is just a, a smidge too slow to get any kind of information out of it. It just makes me really wish I had a secret language, you know? Number 10. The National Razor What's a revolution without a little blood being spilt? Wouldn't really be a revolution, would it? France was having a hard time in the 1700s, so they needed a brand new way to get rid of pesky monarchs and anyone who isn't warming up to the revolutionary ideals. And what better way to keep people warm by cleaving their heads from their body? A man named Joseph Ignace Guillotine suggested that there was a better method for unaliving those who needed to be unalived. A common misconception is that he and invented the guillotine, but rather suggested its implementation, where his name would become synonymous with such a terrible device. Basically, you got a wood frame with a hole for your noggin and a large angled blade. Blade drops down from frame and removes the head of state from the governing body. Which isn't just a clever joke, as that's what happened to the last king and queen of France. 
By the time of its invention and the end of its use all the way up into the 1970s, yes, that's right, it was used up until the 70s, thousands of people met their doom to the National Razor. Number 9. Party Favors in the Sky When you think of air travel today, you think of lots of space for you and your fellow passengers, meals that are flavorful and affordable. Air travel in 2021 is a stress-free, very organized way to travel. But in the 1700s, these luxuries of the sky were non-existent, as there was no air travel. Any international travel was done by ship, which took months at a time and was not a pleasurable experience, opposite to what was described above. Two French brothers wanted to change this, or rather just get off the ground. The two French brothers, Montegolfier, developed and flew the first unmanned hot air balloon on September 19, 1783. This was shortly followed up with a manned flight by Jean-Francois Pilate de Rosier. This was a very strange invention of the time, as this was really the beginning of humans and flight. Number 8. Puckle needs his gun. Ever since black powder first made it to Europe and Europeans figured out you could make big gun that go boom, people have been trying to come up with better and faster ways to make gun go boom. In the 1700s, the biggest issue with muskets and cannons at the time was reloading or getting multiple shots off. Loading black powder weapons isn't easy. I'd say ask a pirate, but you can't. Those, those kind of pirates are all, all gone now. So to fix the issue of the day, a man named James Puckle invented the very cleverly named Puckle Gun. Basically, he just added more chambers of shot rotating around one barrel. Although his idea for the time was genius, in practice it wasn't very effective, as flintlock and black powder are really the main issue. Clumsy, lots of smoke, and does not want to work in less than fair weather conditions. Number 7. Cotton Eye Joe Dear YouTube Gods, I am sorry that history is full of not so cool things, but here at Bumblebee, I'm the Queen Bee, and I'm here to give the buzz to my sweet honeybees. So in the name of good morals, monetization, and not getting smited, I'm going to talk about your least favorite S word. Back in the 1700s, America was chillin'. They just beat Britain in a war, which alone could be its own video. They were starting to build their own country, particularly in the southern colonies, using forced unpaid labor that you can't leave. Oh, and your boss can do heinous things to you because uh, he owns you. Their economy was agricultural based, and state that way for a long time. Tobacco being the number one crop at first, cotton was still grown but wasn't as popular due to the processing of cotton being a very labor intensive and difficult process. This was until Eli Whitney's cotton gin invented in 1794. The cotton gin was a machine that quickly removed seeds and processed cotton, making cotton a very valuable crop since, you know, the people harvesting the cotton are YouTube's least favorite S word. It's a, it's a brutal unpaid workforce. Now that it was profitable, cotton boomed and the South became very wealthy. While not exactly the main reason, the South getting rich off Whitney's design and did somewhat create a divide between the southern states and the northern states, eventually leading to the Civil War. Also, apparently plantation owners didn't pay Eli for his machine and he went broke. Just trashy behavior all around, man, come on. Number 6. Yes, I'm a Russian submarine commander. I actually couldn't believe this one myself, but the submarine was invented in the 1700s. Having designs and plans started in the 1500s, the first real use of a submersible vessel wasn't until 1775, named the Turtle, an acorn-shaped vessel with a crew of just one. To me, it's just hard to think that in the same century we were beginning to master flight and sea travel. I also can't stop thinking that if there was a water ride that existed, it would be pretty cool if you went underwater in like a pod, like a submarine kind of thing. Just an idea for the mouse and the corporation. Of course, it wouldn't be years until after the Turtle that the submarine would see effective use or have a Scottish man play a Russian submarine commander in a really good movie. Russian submarine commander. Number 5. Dawn of the Punch Guard With the Industrial Revolution on the horizon, many things were about to change. Probably the most obvious at the time was factories. While not the first, Richard Arkwright's Cromford Mill in 1771 is what most resembles a modern factory today. Cromford Mill was the first water-powered cotton spinning mill and initially employed 200 workers. It ran day and night with two 12-hour work shifts, the gates being locked at 6am and 6pm, permitting no late arrivals. Oh, he likes to keep a tight schedule. Yeah, I can see the beginnings of a modern factory, all right. All you're missing is Bezos and a couple of drones to make it modern. All jokes aside, though, uh, these early factories changed the very fabric of not only Britain, but also the world. I mean, where would we be today with all that lovely pollution and those great and fair working conditions? I, I, I bet there was benefits, too. Number 4. The Golden Liquid You drink liquid, and then it's gonna come out of you. It's simple. It's science. But sometimes other fluids need to be drained. Sometimes you can have difficulty using the little boys room. 
Personally, I'm still learning how to put down the toilet seat. I haven't quite figured that one out. How to make pee when a person cannot pee. Partly founding father Benjamin Franklin thought to himself as he was holding a kite in the rain. This is something I learned, which I didn't know, is that he invented the flexible catheter. Yep. Next time you feel a little weird because a tube is being inserted into a sensitive area, you can thank the man on the $100 bill. Invented in 1752 in order to aid his brother with bladder stones. It's strange though, you know, you think of a guy inventing other things, but in reality, it's a really important invention and something that's very common in the medical world today. I just hope to stay healthy long enough so no tube has to go near my founding father. Number three, pseudo cool. Okay, so back in the 1700s, food was really hard to keep. For example, meat is packed with a salty brine in order to preserve it. It either has to be shipped overseas or last long enough through a cold and brutal winter. But plans for refrigeration were being drawn up, specifically the idea of vapor compression refrigeration. Not exactly the fridge that's in your kitchen today, considering there's you know, still no main harnessing of electricity, which makes fridges run, but a brilliant idea nonetheless. While the fridge we know was still far away, it's crazy to think in the 1700s we had serious plans for one. While this was being developed, food was kept near lakes and snows in the winter. Runoffs from mountains were often used to keep drinks cool. I think this is something we all take for granted. I mean, can you imagine drinking room temperature your milk or having a beef dinner that tastes saltier than salt? Looking back through history, it's interesting to see how humans persevere. As much as I love food, I don't know if I could stomach food from the past. Thank goodness we don't eat anything gross today. Hey man, uh, do you have any canned cheese left? I'm kind of hungry. Number two, ebony. Ivory, living together in harmony. I honestly thought this one was older than the 1700s, but hey, here we are, invented in the year 1700 by a musically inclined Italian gentleman named Bartolomeo Cristofori. Unhappy with what was going on at the time, he decided to spice it up by changing out a few parts of some common instruments and started using little hammers that strike quickly on chords and come back in hopes they would not dampen the sound. A little fine tuning here and there and bada bing bada boom. You got a piano. I would attempt to make a joke about the piano, but let's be honest. No piano, no Elton John. No jazz, no Frank Sinatra. If you're asking me, that's a big problem. Number one, ABCs. As someone who struggles with reading, this one makes me want to hide under my covers at night. I spent countless hours as a kid learning to read, and oh, man, the phonics lessons were brutal. And thanks to this invention, I can blame it all on the 1755 invention, the English Dictionary. Yep, that's right. One of the most influential too. Written by Samuel Johnson, it took seven years to compile all the words I can't pronounce. He was commissioned 1,500 guineas for the project, which is worth about 250,000 pounds today. Until the completion of the Oxford Dictionary 173 years later, Johnson's Dictionary is considered to be the preeminent English dictionary and a huge achievement in scholarship. I mean, you gotta give the guy credit for writing this. Imagine writing an English essay for seven years. But then again, 250,000 pounds for some of my writing also sounds pretty good. All I have to do now is learn to read and write. Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam of bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow-covered state. <laughs> nice. Now, with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins. Simple. That's it. That's bowling. Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. 
These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number 8. Papyrus I heard Egyptians like paper. Well you're going to be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange. I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number 7. Black ink. So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you going to use to write on it? Ink. You're going to use ink. Obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron based compounds as well as blue, green, white and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number 6. The Haircut a little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. It kind of did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men. We just look better with them. We look, we look good. It's a good look. Number 5. The Plow Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. And to the plow and the evolution of agriculture. So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number 4. The Calendar No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities. Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean clearly if you look at the calendar, I mean clearly it's the, it's the fifth of, uh, well I think it looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. H hieroglyphs are hard man, I don't know. Number 3. Clocks Alright, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock. No. But they did have to tell time, and as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky. The sun. Assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number 2. Mummification Welcome back to the land of the living my friend. 
You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, yes. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. 